very <laughs> organizing us. Um, we are also in collaboration with the Peatland DCR action team. Um, Maria is uh, representing. Um, uh, you might want to give a wee wave. Um, uh, and we have the CPEAT program as well. So as you can see, a, a range of organizations uh, focusing on Peatland. But uh, today's session is all about communicating complex research simply. Whether you are a peatland researcher, and there's lots of complex issues for us to deal with in, uh, in this particular area, uh, or uh, working in any area at all, uh, this is a problem that many of us have. <sighs> How on earth, uh, when we're talking to, say, a policymaker, someone from industry, someone who doesn't understand our jargon, doesn't have the background knowledge, the process-based understanding, the theories, whatever, how can we simplify this uh, in a way that is going to make sense without losing the nuance um, and without potentially misleading people and creating other bigger problems? We are very fortunate today to have two expert trainers with a wealth of experience behind them. We'll be hearing first from uh, Dr. Olivia Ambrogio, who is the Assistant Director of the Sharing Science Programme at the American Geophysical Union, or AGU, as you probably heard it referred to. And uh, for the last 10 years, she's been working with scientists there to connect with wider audiences. Uh, Olivia is a biologist by training. She got a PhD studying the sex lives of marine snails, no less. And in spite of the surprising allure of this research, she eventually shifted into the field of science communication. Uh, you can see the, the roots of this quite clearly, can't you? <laughs> uh, in her spare time, she writes and takes nature photos, uh, often frustrating her partner and uh, friends who just wanted to take a, a walk by crouching on the ground to try and photograph an insect. Um, uh, so yeah, my, my wife and, and family and friends have similar issues with me. Uh, George Hope is communications manager at Oxford Net Zero and the Greenhouse Gas Removal Hub based at Oxford University. And uh, we'll be having some breakout rooms, some discussion and hearing from him in the second half. George is a member of the Chartered Institute of Public Relations, and his experience is in communications, public engagement, policy engagement, events and program management. So it just remains for me to introduce Olivia now and hand over to you. Uh, Olivia, I just realised that I have your slides. Uh, do you want to uh, share your own slides or would you like me to share them for you? Um, I can share them, thanks. I Probably have them right them. here. Let me make sure they're visible. I hope that they're visible to everyone. Perfect, yes. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for, for having me and for that introduction. Uh, very excited to be here. And I just want to talk a little bit about some science communication fundamentals before George goes into some more uh, detailed and specialized information thinking about the digital realm. Could I just remind so, everyone that the session is being recorded? Thank, thank you. you. So I just want to mention that as part of the Sharing Science Program, where we help scientists communicate uh, with many other audiences, I encourage you to check out some of our free online resources. We have a lot of toolkits on communicating in a lot of different ways and with many different audiences. So I do encourage you to, to look into those resources if you'd like to delve a little bit more deeply. I want to talk first about goals for science communication. And Obviously, as mentioned, this is not an exhaustive list and these goals are not mutually exclusive, but I do really encourage you as you engage in science communication to think about what your goals are. And I don't mean simply in the sense of, for example, I want people to know about marine snails, although I do because they should, but really what is the, the larger goal that you want to achieve here? Are you hoping that people will know more, say, about snails, because then they'll know about you as an authority? So if they come across something related to the beach or snails, they'll know that they can come to you and ask questions. Are you hoping that people will behave differently towards snails or shorelands because of what you're talking about? Are you hoping people will recycle more because of what you're saying? Are you hoping people will vote differently because of what you're telling them? What are these sort of longer term goals of 
making more people aware of science and its importance and being aware too that whatever those goals are they are unlikely to be achieved with a single interaction but there's something that you can use to kind of measure your success long term and then you really want to think about your audience because it's effective communication depends on that connection with them and I want to just emphasize the fact that we often talk about sharing with the public but the public is not a monolith Everyone is part of the public, including scientists. And so thinking about what portion of the public you're talking about and what kinds of interests they might have is really important. Because as you start to think about your communication, first you wanna think about your goals as I was just talking about, but then you wanna think about your audience's goals. So you know why you're coming to talk with some people or give a talk or what have you. Why are they there? What are they hoping to get out of it? And then what do you know about your audience's demographics? Are these people who are all perhaps around the same age so that you can make references in common? Or are they all coming from the same region or at least familiar with the same region so you can make a lot of references to landmarks or similar things that are going to have a shared understanding? And what do you know about what your audience values, what they're interested in, what their concerns are? because you really want to be able to use those to frame your science. You don't want this to happen. Uh, this is a cartoon that I drew as a result of many sad graduate school experiences when I realized that just because I was enthusiastic about my research didn't mean that everyone else would be. So this is why framing is very important. And I wanna emphasize that framing to an audience is not about coming in and telling people something like, hey, you know, all of those things that you're worried about, here's another. Or, oh, hello, I've come to tell you how you're wrong about something. Because for some reason, people aren't very receptive to that. Framing is really about saying, look, we all care about jobs in this area. We all care about public health. We care about our children's future. And my science is actually a part of this thing that you've been caring about. So you've been caring about my science all along. You just haven't known it until now. And part of the way you can do that is to make explicit the connections that sometimes when we're in science seem so clear to us between what we do and how it matters to people, but that are not clear at all to those outside the field. So for example, if you're talking about something like uh, hurricane research or, or storm surge research, you wanna put it in the context of how that knowledge can help people protect their homes, their, their businesses, their communities. If you're talking about something like snowpack, uh, you want to talk about how it affects skiing, whether because that's a hobby of the people you're talking with or because it brings tourist dollars to the region. If you're talking about heat waves, you want to put it in the context of things like people being admitted for heat stroke or the amount of energy spent on uh, AC every year. I'm aware that right now we might want to be talking more about cold weather, but still in the, in the long term. Um, and then phenology shifts, although you would not want to call them that, depending on the audience. These can be connected to everyone from hobbyist gardeners to farmers to people who might be concerned to know that uh, new diseases might uh, be more prevalent because the vectors for those diseases are changing their range. Now, some of this you might have to ask your audience about to find out more about what they, what they know or are concerned about, or you might have to do some research, but I think it's kind of encouraging to realize that often we can anticipate at least some of our audience's interests and and sort of build that in from the beginning to what we're talking about and how we're framing what we're saying so for example if i'm talking to 10 year olds about snails marine snails then i probably know in advance right that they're going to ask me questions about why are they slimy what do they eat what eats them i saw a snail once can you keep them as pets what else do you study what about whales where in the beach right so i'm going to need to be thinking a lot about sort of uh, marine life writ large, how to respond to those questions or comments, uh, certain kinds of things around snail behavior, maybe wanna bring in a shell for people to look at or something like that. If I'm talking to a chamber of commerce, on the other hand, they're probably going to want to know about the commercial importance of the snails or lack thereof. And if there is no commercial importance to them, why I'm talking to them to begin with. So it's a whole different set of interests that I can build into what I'm talking about to begin with, to better tailor what I'm saying to the interests of the audience. There are a couple of things to be aware of with more specialized audiences, like policymakers and journalists. In the case of policymakers, they're often going to say, at least in the US, what's the ask? Which is 
egregious grammar, I hate it, but essentially means what is the request that you're coming to me with? Because uh, pretty much universally, if you come to a policymaker without a request, they're going to feel that you're wasting their time. Now, this request doesn't always have to be around funding, around uh, voting, although it can be. It can be what's called a relationship request. Once again, saying, I have expertise in this area, and I want you to know that it is at your disposal. So should you see any upcoming legislation or issues related to this area of science, please feel free to talk with me, and I would be happy to walk you through it, connect you with other experts, give you the broader context. With journalists, their audience, and therefore yours, are their readers or listeners or viewers. So you'll often get this question, and I have seen it from my science writer colleagues, so what? And they're not saying it to be dismissive or aggressive. What they're essentially saying is, put this in a context that's going to matter to my audiences. What's the human dimension? What's the societal uh, dimension? What are the implications for this that will matter to these audiences so that I can bring it to them in a way that they're going to care about? And just a few other things to remember as you think about broader communication. Uh, one is that almost nobody knows what you're talking about. And this is simply because, this is an XKCD comic, we forget what is, uh, let's say, normal for everyone else. So the average person probably only knows the formulas for olivine and one or two feldspars and quartz, of course. Of course, you know, we, we, we forget what other people might know or not. And so it's really important to think about how you can speak the same language and be accessible to those that you're talking with. And I want to really emphasize that this is not dumbing things down. That phrase drives me crazy because it feels so, it, it, I feel as if it expresses a lot of contempt for the audience. Whereas what this is really about is demonstrating your respect for that audience and for their time and for what matters to them. So, I, you know, I'm a smart, well-educated person, have a PhD, but if I go to a car mechanic, I don't want them to sit me down for a lecture on different aspects of the car and really detailed jargon around it. I want them to tell me in general terms, what's wrong with it? How is it going to be fixed? And how much is it going to cost? Because that is what matters to me within that interaction. So jargon is one of those areas that ends up putting up this unnecessary barrier between you and your audience. And that's why it's really great to try to eliminate it or at least reduce it. And jargon can include everything from technical terminology to excessive or undefined acronyms, obscure or long, unnecessarily long words, and words with multiple meanings, by which I mean words that have a different sort of first connotation for those of us within science versus those of us outside of it. Uh, and in sharing science, we have a whole slew of these. And I don't mention them to say, never use these words, but just to point out that it's really worthwhile, again, to be aware of audience and to spell out what your meaning is for these to start with so that you don't have people sort of going off on a mental tangent when you're trying to communicate with them, um, particularly around things like positive feedback or modeling that have very different associations for people outside of science. We have a whole toolkit on this and jargon illumination. One good way to get rid of jargon, too, is to use the Upgoer 5 challenge. So this is that same cartoonist of XKCD. He drew the Saturn V rocket and explained it using only the thousand most common words in English. And it was so inspiring that there are now text editors out there that you can go to, put in your science, have uh, read underline the words that you're not allowed to use. And this is a great way. It's very entertaining. We actually have a scientific session on this at AGS Fall Meeting. Um, I would not recommend going back to your audience with this language because this is actually dumbing things down, but it's a really great exercise because when you are forced to put everything that you're talking about in the absolute simplest terms and really think about the essence of what you're saying, it's much easier to move from that back to a conversational level than to try to sort of synonym your way out of you know, your abstract into talking with someone else. Okay, you've thought about audience and eliminating jargon. How can you develop those messages, that distillation of your points, so that after you've talked with whomever it is, if somebody asks them in two weeks what you talked about, these are the things that are, they're going to remember. Just a few tips around developing messages. You really do want to make those connections clear, because you could say something about soil moisture, 
decreasing by so much in so many years. And that's a clear message, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. If you say that because of this decrease in soil moisture, drought has intensified, which is putting more pressure on water resources and increasing the threat of wildfires, now it actually has meaning. You can use metaphors to explain complex or technical issues. So removing or developing small patches of wilderness can be devastating for migratory birds or migrating birds. Um, I have to, you have to excuse me, this metaphor was that I created was more appropriate for the US where we have a very large country and love our road trips. But imagine heading out on a cross country trip and discovering there are no more rest stops until Montana. That's how birds feel when we get rid of their stopover points. For those from elsewhere, Montana is very far away from everything except Montana. Use social math. So saying that um, a volcano is oozing around 80,000 cubic meters of mud each day, that sounds like a lot. It is a lot. If you add that's enough to fill 32 Olympic sized pools, now we have a much more tangible idea in our minds of just how huge an amount that is. Social math is so helpful for making things feel more real and more tangible for an audience. And the great thing is that there are a lot of resources like this one, the measure of things, where if you put in measurements, uh, they can tell you, oh, that's about the weight of an elephant or about the height of an Eiffel Tower. So you don't have to search for these yourself. And then brevity is great, but you don't want to become so brief that once again, you lose the meaning for your audience. So to say, I study the Pine Island Glacier, I study the Pine Island Glacier, the fastest melting glacier in Antarctica, responsible for about a quarter of Antarctica's ice loss thus far. Now we know where it is. Now we know why it might be important to study that. And then especially if you're talking about something where you have a call to action for your audience, you want to make sure that you end on a positive note. Because if you tell people that we're all going to die and then you ask them to recycle, they are not going to be inclined to do that. There's a lot of research out there showing that when you emphasize doom and gloom too much, you cause in your audience either a, a denial reaction where they refuse to believe anything you've said, or you sort of send them into despair and they give up. So what you want to do is emphasize the opportunity that using science to enact change will have to protect and preserve what you have or to even improve upon it. When you give people a sense of agency, that is really motivating. And I just want to talk a little bit about dealing with skeptical audiences, although in a lot of ways, it's the same as any other kind of communication. I do want to emphasize that there are many different reasons for skepticism of science. One is that certain areas of science have become highly politicized to the point where some people feel that science is in direct opposition to their values. Another reason, especially with groups that have been historically marginalized is that science has been actively used as a, a tool of disenfranchisement. So it's really something to keep in mind in terms of how you're presenting yourself and science when you come to different audiences. If you come in with a sort of science is going to save everyone, you're going to come across as at best as disingenuous and at worst as sort of maliciously lying to them. So you really want to think about how you can present yourself confidently because you are an expert in your area, but also humbly because you want to build a dialogue and build a connection with other people, or at least respectful, let me say, if not humble. Because really connection, communication is all about connection. It's not about sort of stuffing people with facts as if they're pate geese until they think the way you want them to. So if you look at the figure on the right about climate change being human caused, so poll in the US, and you can see that the difference in opinion based on a uh, political party, only the gaps only get wider, the more education that people have, they just become more entrenched in their views. Because again, if the facts are being perceived as being in opposition to your values, it doesn't matter what facts you throw at people. So you really want to make sure that you're humanizing and personalizing the science and you as the scientist. You're coming in, maybe you're a part of the community already. Maybe you want them to know a little bit about you as a person. Maybe you want to tell a story, this is another one of our toolkits, about how you got into science so that they can see that you are doing this out of passion. There's no hidden agenda. 
you can try to anticipate some of the skeptical questions or comments you might get so that you can bring them into what you're talking about to begin with. So some people might say, well, why aren't we spending money on housing instead of this research? And I totally get that. However, if we spend money on this research, we can also, et cetera, et cetera. When you bring that up to begin with, not only are you making sure that you don't have that question later, but you're letting your audience see that you are already thinking about them and their concerns. Try to create dialogue. So come in and start not by, by speaking to people, but by asking questions. What is your experience with flooding? What kind of uh, experience have you had with natural hazards, with peatlands, with beaches, with whatever it is you want to talk about, so that you can hear from them and let them know that you want to do that. Again, connect around those shared values. What are the things that matter to all of you and that your science is a part of? And this is especially true for online trolls or in-person hecklers. Be mindful of tone in your real audience. There are always going to be a few people, if there are more hostile people, who are just never going to be convinced. They're only there to attack and to spout their own opinions. But your reaction to them is going to affect the quiet people around those loud people. So you want to make sure that you don't respond with the same level of aggression or snarkiness as the person who's picking at you, and that the messages that you use are the ones that you want everyone else to be hearing. And then two, be able to not get sucked down these rabbit holes. Sometimes people are asking deliberately to pull you off course, sometimes because they don't understand, but you want to be able to bridge back to your messages saying things like, you know, that's not really what we studied, but in my work I've seen, back to your message. That's not my field, but I can try to find that out for you later. What I do know is, or if someone keeps persisting, I'd really be happy to talk with you about that later. What I can tell you now, and then you go back to the points that you wanted to make. So we're going to have an activity, um, but I just want to check, it's hard to tell while I'm sharing my screen, if we have any questions. So there's uh, one question, but it's from me, so you do not need to prioritize okay. that. Um, <laughs> uh, if there are any other questions, if you want to raise your hand briefly or write into the chat, um, and then we'll move to the breakout rooms. And uh, if not, then I'm going to suggest we move straight to the breakout rooms. Uh, and if you do have any other questions for Olivia, then uh, when we come back and report back, we can uh, tackle any other questions and maybe at that point. Thank you. Um, I would just say that, um, OK, yes, leave that. Oops. <laughs> We have the breakout room seem to have opened earlier than anticipated. <laughs> um, do you want to explain to those who are left and uh, we can... Um... Yeah, uh, just that I would encourage those who are in rooms with uh, up to five to start with thinking about community groups and journalists as audiences and what their values and concerns and questions might be. And those in rooms... Uh, six and up to start with farmers and policymakers and then if you have time for the other audiences to come to those to those other ones later um, the rooms are actually about to close because that they were oh, no. for the wrong amount of time i think oh no okay Too well many cooks swallow the broth, <laughs> they say. so uh, 10 seconds jane if you can try and restart that so i will that do um i will be back in two seconds yeah <laughs> we are okay great right so we've got them for uh how long do you want them for, uh, uh, ten, nine yeah ten minutes great uh, there you go and everyone will be sent automatically right if you went to a breakout room and you've just come back and you want to hear the instructions again just stay behind before you click on the link again and um and we can explain again what the plan is uh, anyone who's uncertain, just stay behind. And uh, uh, Olivia, do you mind a, a, a brief recap? On Not at all. <laughs> so for a few minutes uh, in each group, please um, talk within your group 
about these different audiences and try to think about what their concerns and values might be. And also, if you think they might have skeptical questions or comments, what those might be. And I would encourage those in rooms one through five to start with the first two, community groups and journalists. And if you have time, get to the other two, farmers and policymakers. And the reverse with room six and up. Start with farmers and policymakers. And if you have time to come to journalists and community groups, then think about those as well. Right. Um, so I think this is not quite working how I was expecting. We have um, one person in a room by themselves. I wonder, can we uh, reassign Thomas one maybe to room 10? What do you think? Which room is he in? He's in room seven. I can do that um, if you'd like, but... Room 10? Yeah, because there's, there's only yeah. one person in room 10 as well. Right. Well, it looks like only... I think we've set up too many rooms, that's what it is. I had I had eight set up originally, but uh, we've got 11 now. Yeah. Wow. Technology, yeah. <laughs> It looks like we have enough people for discussion in each. I think we've got a few people who haven't joined. Yeah. Okay. I can uh, do it automatically um, next time so they don't have to press the button. Yeah, okay, great. If you know how to do that, brilliant. Shall we go and join the rooms uh, and just see who else is in the main room? So there's a few people in the main room. Are you having technical problems or would you rather just sit out? Do let us know if you're having technical problems. I'm just sitting it out. No worries, Chris. How are you? <laughs> well, I'm I'm pretending I haven't got COVID, but I I think I have. But um, I can I can listen, but I can't I can't engage the brain. Yep, okay. That's challenging, I feel, for you, Chris. Uh, do uh, take a wee break, then, and we'll speak to you soon. Um, I think I'll maybe go and join room three, because it's got uh, not that many people in it. If someone else maybe wants to go and join room two, what do you say? Should we do that? Or do you want to just stay in the main room, Olivia, George, Jane? I don't mind joining a group. Um, I could... Yeah, shall I go to number two? Yeah, yeah just stay in for a in. moment. Yeah. Going to, uh... This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the main group. Uh, I hope you had some good conversation. And I'm wondering if anyone would like to share with the larger group what kinds of thoughts you had about the various audiences, if anyone wants to either put something in the chat uh, or raise their hand, either way. Ah, okay. Discuss the use of the word bog in press releases. Okay. Lyndon has his hand up. Okay, please go ahead. So it just took me ages to find the raise your hand button. Um, yeah, so it, where where we're working in in Yorkshire, the the farmers with whom we are working have just been doing this for a very long time, you know, generations of uh, of sheep farming up on the tops of Yorkshire, and I think they feel threatened by our work because it damages their sense of place in the world, um, mm. their sense of place in Yorkshire and their sense of history. So. It is a thing that we need to pay attention, pay attention to when we are dealing with them and explaining why we are doing what we are doing. That's a great point. Yeah. 
That's great that you've been able to spend enough time with them to understand where mm -hmm. some some resistance or concern might be coming from. Uh, you know what it's what it's stemming from and what sort of fears they have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I mean. It, <clears throat> It's a funny thing where we are because although they are farming the land, they don't own any of it. Most of the land is owned and managed actually for grouse, but uh, these are tenant farmers and it's easier to get this work done if we can get them on our side mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and they're approaching the landowners on our alongside us rather than against us. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I see Marky fun, similar things. Yeah, I see several people who've been interacting with farmers who are feeling that a lot of it has to do with, can you be aware of the concerns of, of the people you want to work with? Yes, whether it's about, as you were saying, this, this fear about having a, a sense of identity changed or whether it's about, can I still pay the bills with whatever you're telling me to change? And there are no easy answers, but the awareness is, is really the first step. Uh, ah, I see there's some, some back and forth on the feeling of what the connotation of bogs are, <laughs> depending on location. All right. Can I jump in there? Please. Um, just, just in terms of the peatland, you see, in, 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 we have fens and we have bogs in Wales. And it's a very complex area. And in Welsh, even we call everything bog, which is technically incorrect, etc. So that's why we're really pushing for the word peatland as a catch-all for all those uh, different uh, peatland identities. And also, if you were doing comms and you wanted to track the comms, it's much easier to find comms if you do a peatland search rather than a bog search. <laughs> and it's far more pleasant. <laughs> That's a great point. And for those uh, not based in the UK, uh, the, the the word bog is uh, a collo colloquial word for uh, for the word toilet. So um, yes, you you may get uh, some unexpected images uh, from British websites. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so in saying speaking the same language, we also need to be aware of idiom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Another great point. Well, I don't want to cut this short, but I want to make sure George has enough time. So Indeed, I... I'm just looking at our timings and we do need to be moving on um, in the next minute or two, if that's OK. Um, any final thoughts that you'd like to share with us, Olivia, before we do just reflecting on what you've read in the um, in the chat and, and heard from Linda? Uh -huh. and only to say that it, it sounds as if many of you have already been giving a lot of, of profound and, and, and really uh, uh, introspective thought to how to interact with the audiences that you want to work with and how to make sure that you're still uh, taking into account what matters to them, which is, which is terrific. And I think even if you know all of the language or, or all of the communication is not there yet, having come to that point already is really a huge step because it, it helps make everyone being much more willing to come into dialogue together. Brilliant. And uh, we may have some more time for discussion at the end and do feel free to come back into the discussion um, after, after George's um, session as well. So uh, I'm going to hand over to George next, and George is going to think in particular about how we can communicate these kinds of messages through digital media. Uh, huge power, but huge uh, pitfalls as well, and, uh, and of course lots of controversy around uh, the, the platform Twitter at the moment. So George, uh, let's hand over to you and, um, and see what we can learn from you. Again, we'll be discussing this. Um, in our small groups after. Thanks, George. Great. Thanks very much, Mark and Olivia. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, and thanks for inviting me. Um, can you see the screen okay at the moment? Should, should yes. have shared. Yes. Yeah. Great. 
Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, as Mark said, I'm going to speak a bit more about digital communications. Um, so my role is um, part of two um, research projects. One is um, CORE, which some of you might be sort of uh, tangentially related to through the Greenhouse Gas Removal Demonstrators Programme. Um, so really we work on greenhouse gas removal um, methods. And Oxford Net Zero is the other one, which is based at Oxford and is an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research program um, on the uh, challenges of reaching net zero in the UK. So I think what we'll look at today in these slides, um, I'm going to talk briefly about why we might communicate digitally. Um, and I have uh, included a little bit about why not, I guess, in brackets, communicate digitally as well, because as, as Mark mentioned, there are some pitfalls and there are some things that need to be considered before kind of launching into um, digital communications. And by that, by the kind of term digital communications, I'm meaning really an organization or a project or an individual's online communications efforts in order to reach a particular goal is how I would um, like to define it. Um, so I guess in this session, really, we're thinking about it more from a individual's point of view, an individual researcher, but then it also might be on the project level. Um, we're not necessarily thinking about it in, in the organizational level where you might have whole teams of people who are working on social media, graphic design, all that kind of thing. Um, but really the project and, and individual level is probably most interesting um, for a group of researchers like yourselves. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about thinking strategically, which I think is kind of my number one takeaway um, from the session. Um, and then I've got some of my top tips. So I've been working in this space for about five years now, mostly at Imperial College, actually, for four years. Um, and I was doing um, mostly communications around um, uh, policy ideas from, from Imperial researchers, which was really fun. Um, and now my role is kind of more of an in-house communications person who does mostly digital comms. Um, so I'm gonna share some of my top tips based on those five years. And then I've got an activity which is essentially um, in, bre in breakout groups again, um, creating a mini digital comms strategy for a research paper. So if there's anybody who would like to think about in the next 15 minutes while I'm presenting, if they've got a research paper that they would like to share with the smaller group um, and ideally it'd be great if you could share it with the, the wider group as well as a, as a, as a team um, but basically just thinking through and drafting some bullet points about some of these st strategic questions of how you could communicate it online oops there we go so in terms of why communicate digitally then um, there are lots of reasons one of the main ones is to spread the word about your research. Um, that can lead to increased um, citations. Um, and this is a kind of question about reach. So how many people can it get to? That's not necessarily a, a, an impact point. The second one, it can increase the impact of your work. But obviously, this does depend on what you're wanting to achieve um, in your research and, and in your digital communications. Um, simply, you know, tweeting to... A thousand people isn't necessarily going to do that, but it does increase um, increase reach. This one I think is really important um, to me personally. I think it, I think it's a, a really great reason to do so, um, but it does kind of come with some risks. Um, it's con contributing evidence to debates. We're in a kind of fractured online space at the moment where there's an awful lot going on and lots of important issues that need um, sensible kind of research evidence-based um, opinions out there, I believe. And the online realm is a place where you can publicize your methods and your ideas to the mainstream. Um, you know, the traditional method of publishing in journals is great. And there's obviously the movement towards open access journals, um, which is fantastic allowing anybody to go, go through and, and, and access that. Um, but there is a question about the kind of broader accessibility of even open access research. You know, as Olivia put so well, you know, we can't assume 
that people are going to understand what your research is about is you know it's complex it's really journals are for experts in a sense um and this is what digital communications is about in in a research context it's about reaching other audiences who might not have access to journals either through paywall or because of other barriers um sorry i've clicked two at once there um so the next one is to be an active part of an online community um and actually these link these two points link together really nicely um there, there are whole communities out there where you can use them as a soundboard to crowdsource ideas they can be a place of insight they can be a place where you can learn what kind of language is used to talk about the stuff that you care about so that was quite interesting about the peatlands and bogs point um you know another example from my uh, the work that i do is that most of the world uses the term carbon dioxide removal and the uk tends to use greenhouse gas removal which can be slightly confusing so thinking about who that audience might be and which terminology they actually use and then are there any opportunities to engage with that community it's called you know social media for a reason because it it should be a kind of two-way um conversational device rather than just an opportunity to say here's my research um findings and then also and i suppose this is quite a straightforward point but it's a, you know the online world is constantly moving forward it's constantly changing and it's a source of news and events and papers relating to your research so there's an opportunity to, there to hear about what's happening and be bang up to date with that and also um you can I, i'll speak a little bit more about this later but you can also be part of that resource for other people by sharing um, things that are going on. So the next point I wanted to make was that there's an awful lot of noise and opportunities um, and an awful lot of choice uh, with the online realm. Um, and I just wanted to, as a kind of thought experiment, really just brainstorm some of the things that I do day to day. Um, so for example, things like blogs, briefings, emails, FAQs, feature articles, infographics, interviews, newsletters, news stories, online events, podcasts, presentations, reports, social media, videos, and websites. Now, that is quite a lot of different things, and it's quite overwhelming, I think, and it can leave you feeling a little bit like this. <laughs> um, you know, there's there's just an awful lot to think about and an awful lot to fit in. And is there a way that as a researcher who has limited time and whose priority is likely to just be the research that you're you're working on, and quite rightly, and also the administrative, you know, tasks that go with that, perhaps teaching as well. Um, are there a way, is there a better way of thinking about, okay, if I'm going to do some digital communications, how on earth do I start thinking about which of all of those, that huge range of things, um, I actually engage with. So that comes down to strategy, really, and thinking strategically. Um, and I think the most important question is what do you actually want to achieve? Because if we don't think about, you know, taking a big step back and a deep breath about those kind of that, that horrible list of, of things to do, um, we can cross it out and say, actually, what do we want to achieve by by communicating digitally online? And that will link most likely to your research and what you're wanting to achieve with specific audiences, which is the second point about thinking strategically, which is who do you want to communicate with and why? And they should be very closely linked. Um, so this is your audience, who, who is actually going to be uh, the people who are going to be consuming um, the information that you're putting out online. And why is it them? You know, if you're, uh, if you want to achieve kind of some kind of policy um, influence, then it might be that you communicate with, um, you know, mid-level um, policy advisors in DEFRA who are working on a particular area that you're interested in. Um, or it might be that you want to engage with um, members of the public uh, and a broad range of members of the public in order to inform, um, you know, some, some, 
research that you're doing on a particular area next. And where are they? I think that's a, a really key question as well. And obviously that doesn't mean are they in Scotland or in Cornwall? That's a question of where are they spending their time online? Um, so it might be that uh, LinkedIn is a really good place to reach people like that. Uh, or it might be that actually um, a kind of session like this or a kind of online Zoom roundtable type discussion might be more appropriate. Uh, it could be a combination of both, but basically thinking about which media would work best in order to reach that target audience. And a shout out to some of Mark's work here because there's some really great tools on fast track impact and there's there's a, a link there in the in the slides. I'm sure we can post it in the chat as well. Um, but there's some really good tools and templates on Mark's website about thinking strategically. For example, if you were wanting to, um, if you decided that social media was going to be a good avenue for you, there's some uh, templates on there about how you could think about what you want, what your goals are, who you want to communicate with, and why, um, and so on. This is a quite a nice table that I've taken from a um, a book that I like. It's called Mass Appeal. Um, it's by a U.S. political scientist called Justin Guest. Um, he did a talk to our team a couple of years ago, and I really liked hearing about the research that he's doing. Um, but it is quite high level. And as Olivia mentioned earlier, actually, that, you know, it's important to drill down into the who specifically are you talking about? So once you've decided that who you want to um, communicate with is public or elites or decision makers, actually drilling down a little bit further into who within the public I think it's you know it doesn't really make sense just to say the public um you know we're all part of it and and who specifically are you talking about and then the in terms of the message are you communicating a kind of broad overview so some kind of key points something you could summarize in you know bullet points for example or is it a bit more detailed is it would it be a couple of pages um a short report something like that so, for example, to take the very top one, if you're communicating with um, a specific audience that's part of the public and you want to give them an overview, it might be a me media interview or an op-ed that you opt for. Um, if we go with the second one, elites, and we want to give them details, we might think about something like an executive summary or policy briefing. So I just thought this was a quite a nice tool um, to start thinking about how to engage across kind of... Uh, different messages for different audiences and different media to do that with. So I just wanted to share some of my, I'm just gonna see how I'm doing for time. So yeah, I think about five minutes left. Um, some of my sort of top tips um, in, in the communications work that I've done before. So I think trial and error is really important. Um, so learning from other people's successes is a is a great place to start so I think we've all got people that we could look to um other researchers uh who are doing things that we think are great um learning from some of their successes what kind of uh content lands um trying things out not being afraid to give it a go and see how it goes uh, keep an eye on monitoring it and adapt accordingly if you think okay well that doesn't really go anywhere, that's okay. Um, you've learned from that. There are a ton of free tools online that you can use for improving your dig dig digital communications. Um, for example, Canva is an amazing graphic design tool that is completely free. I think there's a pro version actually, but the, the free version is excellent. And um, it really massively will improve any kind of infographics, videos, um, Twitter banners, anything like that, that you create very, very easily. TweetDeck is, is a tool for scheduling tweets. So if you wanted to release um, some information at you know 2 p.m. tomorrow, but you realize you're in a conference and you don't really want to be sitting on your phone all day, you can schedule tweets, no problem at all, and um, it will send it out automatically at that time. And Google Analytics um, to see how things like your websites or your blogs might be doing, 
what the global spread of the audience is, things like that. I won't say much about this because I think Olivia covered it really well. Um, but in the online world, just using plain language, defining terms and avoiding acronyms uh, is important. This is a plug for comms colleagues like myself. Um, so I think comms colleagues will want to talk to you if you have, you know, you might have a comms um, colleague on your project. If not, um, you might sort of go um, a level higher and go institutional or department, for example. Um, but essentially, that's a resource there that people like me spend all day, every day um, helping researchers with their communications. So we really want to hear from you. Providing a call to action. Again, Olivia mentioned this, um, and I liked it because Olivia you actually framed it slightly differently to say a positive call to action, which I really, really liked as well. So I can maybe add that in brackets the next time, but provide a, a call to action. So that's things like a link to a research paper, an invite to an event, signing up to a newsletter, because you want to keep an engagement journey going. You don't want people to read your, your um, tweets or watch your video or read your briefing and say, oh, that was interesting and then never engage with you again. Um, if they found it interesting, you, you really want them to, to actually um, continue that journey with some of the content that you're putting out there. And a few more. So I think I spoke about this briefly earlier, but considering sharing news and feature articles on your, on your topic. Um, so if you want to build a kind of um, reputation and dare I say it sounds very corporate, but a brand um, around the kind of work that you're doing and yourself uh, as a researcher or your research project, um, sharing the latest on, on um, the work that's going on in your community is a really great way to start, I think. Um, and you, there are opportunities to just add comments and perspectives and people will want to hear from that. Um, this is something I came across a lot in my previous role at Imperial, where I found that um, policymakers, for example, will sometimes search for academics and search for experts in a particular area, but they'll find it quite difficult if um, researchers haven't uh, thought about how they come across online. So often you'll have an institutional profile, and that's you know something that you can work on and um, write a couple of paragraphs about what you're doing. I'd recommend, um, just as a bit of fun, uh, uh, asking a member of your family or a friend who's not a researcher in your area to have a read of it and see if they understand what you do and see if they can point out bits that they don't understand. Um, and then it could tell you that it could do with a bit of work. I think thinking about it as a kind of shop window where you know people are walking past and if they if they look into that shop window and if they don't have a clue what it's what's going on um then they're probably not going to get in touch but there might be journalists policymakers industry people who might be really interested in what you're doing but if they don't see it and understand it then they're not gonna it's not gonna go very far and this is my final point on my tips and it links to what mark said at the very intro is not doing digital communications just because or just for the sake of it um it can be very tempting to kind of launch into um spending lots of time on social media or creating some really nice um policy briefings or um setting up a whole range of um events for example and that takes an awful lot of time and i think linking back to the initial point of thinking strategically and being aware of what you share, um, you're sharing it for a reason. You're linking it back to some of your research aims, um, for example, and also considering the risks as well. Um, so, you know, online abuse is common, sadly. Um, I, I uh, tweet a lot for Oxford Net Zero and pretty much every tweet gets some kind of um, kickback usually from um, somebody who's questioning climate science for example um, that's fairly common um, there are also you know certain communities are much more likely than others to receive that there are things you can do to minimize uh, the likelihood of that and there are things you can do to minimize uh, 
to, uh, to maximize rather your your privacy online you don't have to be sharing everything if you're not comfortable with that um and once you've considered those things you know you can decide accordingly whether you want to do these digital communications um but they're not necessarily for everyone um you can just have descri a description of what you do um and a way to contact you and that be that for the online sphere uh, i think that's perfectly legitimate as well Great, so uh, here's my um, activity that I'd love you to uh, have a go at. Um, so it's about thinking strategically. So linking back to everything that I've talked about so far. Um, so if you're able to select a research paper by somebody in the group, um, that would be fantastic. So if you're in a group of five or six, and maybe Jane, maybe if we made the groups slightly bigger than last time, just in case. Yes, I have to. You know. Okay, great. Um, so selecting a research paper by somebody in the group and essentially creating a very mini, uh, digital comms strategy. So that's essentially answering these three questions. Um, what do you, what do you want to achieve? Whom do you want to reach and why, and how will you reach them? And I realize this is a kind of, you know, a small practice version, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, a bit of fun really just to get you thinking about um strategic ways of thinking about communicating and yeah bring back some ideas to the group it would great be great to hear if anybody can um, share a couple of ideas uh, of what they would like to do in terms of sharing a research paper to a particular audience fantastic so george fascinating and uh, looking forward to, uh, to discussing this, putting this into practice. So, uh, Jane, if you can open the uh, breakout rooms, brilliant. And uh, we will all yeah, see you back here in about 10 minutes. Fantastic. Welcome back, everyone. So, George, what do you want to do next? Let's report well, back. Yeah, um, I hope your discussions were interesting and went well. Um, so yeah, as a recap, we were asking you if anybody could share a sort of research paper that they um, have written or a part of recently and creating a mini digital comms strategy, um, which is a, a, quite a fancy term for a few bullet points, really. <laughs> I was thinking more uh, in the space of 10 minutes. So if anybody would like to either raise their hand to share what they talked about or um, put something in the chat, that would be great. I don't know if anyone would like to feedback on behalf of their group. I could say something briefly for, uh, so um, this was uh, Micah, uh, Micah Lama, who uh, her, her PhD research was looking at restoration um, and some quite complex stuff on different restoration strategies and how successful they might be. Um, and realizing that although the oil and gas industry and the people who were decommissioning sites um, uh, were the, the kind of the target audience for it, in reality for, for this paper, this is going to be the ecologists that they employ who might be able to then actually use the findings of this paper. Uh, and and then we just kind of realise well actually now for the oil and gas uh, people perhaps there's a, a a bigger message to them which is that you need to fund more work like this so that you can get more studies like this that can then enable restoration to be much more effective and so uh, we we focused on those different messages um, to different groups and, and trying to tailor the, uh, where we target the very specific um, information to uh, versus bigger kind of broader messages. Mm. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, actually, because if, you, if you're thinking about one kind of big industry like oil and gas, it could get quite overwhelming thinking about, okay, who who within that do we actually specifically want to talk to? Who's the real target audience? And I think drilling down to say it actually is the ecologists is one way of kind of thinking, OK, that's a, a more specific group that we can talk to. It seems more manageable, but also then taking a step back and thinking what's a kind of more overarching narrative about some asks that we could communicate to the oil and gas uh, leadership, I suppose. Um, yeah, that's that's a really nice way of thinking about it, kind of two two levels of communication almost that serve different purposes. 
great, thank you. Somebody had their hand up, was it Lindsay? I don't know if you still would like to. <laughs> yes, I can chip in as well. There was some overlaps between the two groups, it sounds like. So um, I volunteered a paper that I'd worked on that was also about restoration in different ecosystem types. Um, and it was about kind of decide using a sort of a decision making process for deciding when you when you might favour a very active approach versus uh, a sort of a, a more natural approach or things in between. Um, and we had quite a nice conversation about different audiences um, that it might be rele very relevant to practitioners. And then with with a bit more kind of conversation, uh, the group drew out of me that actually one of the points that we'd made was about funders as well and um, about the fact that they might need to know that they could invest in projects that aren't just necessarily the very sort of typically active tree planting or whatever the equivalent is um that that actually valuing those kind of more natural approaches is beneficial as well um and we didn't we didn't quite complete our digital strategy but we thought that using twitter might be more beneficial for sort of communicating with other scientists whereas with the practitioners you might you might better sort of benefit from stakeholder meetings and that kind of thing. And we came to the same conclusion, yeah, uh, site visits, uh, conferences, hands-on, face-to-face with practitioners, perhaps more than online. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting because, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be digital communications as kind of goes back to the, the point from before. It could be that exactly in-person meetings, conferences, site visits are the, are the best uh, way forward but I think going through that conversation and considering the different options um, is a really great way to, to to figure that out so yeah thank you for that um, we've got a couple of ones in the chat don't know if either of you want to speak to either of these <laughs> just because there's quite a lot of text for me to skim through um, either Sean or, or Hannah just to say we didn't have a research paper, but um, I think one of the key points that came out was showing th the reason why people should be interested in this. Um, so why it's relevant to mot uh, motivate them. So the reason it's because the research will improve your techniques or your practice. And then uh, uh, the strategy includes identifying the audience and the, the hashtags and the handles, et cetera, aligning mm. them up to be relevant. So it's about useful tools for for researchers and practitioners. Um, so, so the research we called up was something to do with um, a, a, um, peatland monitoring uh, improvements. Somebody else can help me out with what exactly it was. <laughs> <laughs> but so we applied applied the kind of practice to that. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. And also, yeah, thinking of. Um, researchers as an audience I think two slightly less obvious ones have come up in succession one is funders and one is researchers it doesn't necessarily always come down to the kind of typical ones that I think of anyway which is probably policy industry publics um excuse me <laughs> you have cat, a, a shouty cat on your desk at the moment <laughs> No problem. Does anybody else like to volunteer anything? Uh, just uh, just point out um, the different groups here. So Sean saying um, for the public, Facebook instead of Twitter, I think, especially if you're trying to do something quite specific geographically. Um, it's interesting to consider. Um, I, I never know whether to use hashtags or not. Um, does that help? Does it just make it harder to read what you're saying? And I, I don't know if others have strong views on this. Hannah, your group um, clearly thought that was important. Um, yeah, I just have no idea. I'm not saying it's not. <laughs> I, I'd appreciate uh, if there are people who have strong views on that either way. I think if you want like a global reach, you could just like mm -hmm. do peak things matter or something, whatever. Uh, just if it's a global that. thing, but look, regional, I think you're right. Facebook is better. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. I think if it's 
I think don't go overboard on hashtags is generally good because it does make it quite hard to read if there's lots of them. Um, but I would say if it's around something like a conference or an event, you know, using hashtag hashtag COP27 at the moment seems to, to help with engagement, for example. Um, and if it's around a specific campaign, um, sort of struggling to think of one off the top of my head, but if there's a campaign hashtag that different stakeholders are all using for a common goal, then I think using it is really helpful because that means that you could engage with that community um, together. We had an interesting, in terms of Facebook and Twitter, we had, we, in the core project, wanted to recruit members of the public to take part in a uh, discussion about greenhouse gas removal. And there was a presentation about what it is. And there were the, some, then some questions to elicit some feedback on that. And we found that when we advertised it via Twitter, we just couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't even get 10 people uh, to sign up and they, they were receiving a voucher as well for their time. But when we put it on Facebook, we actually got hundreds of people signing up. And I'm not sure the exact reasons behind that. But I do think it was quite interesting, and perhaps Facebook has has a broader reach, and Twitter seems to be um, kind of a professional community of of you know in the in the research climate area. Um, so I thought that was quite an interesting anecdote. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. So definitely worth uh, thinking more broadly than just Twitter for many reasons mm. at the moment. Um, yeah. So I'm going to conclude things in a moment. Um, I'd love to know what you thought of today. So you've got a link in the chat there. But uh, it just remains me, first of all, to say a massive, massive thank you to uh, George and Olivia in particular, today's speakers, but uh, Jane in particular, without whom this uh, none of this would be happening. So uh, thank you all three huge amounts of preparation and organization behind the scenes. So uh, I am very grateful to you all. Uh, as I said in the chat, we'd love to know what you think. There's a link to our survey in there. Uh, also, you can see our previous sessions, and uh, we're making the videos available via the links there. Um, uh, you can follow the Global Peatlands Initiative on Eventbrite to find new sessions uh, as they're coming up. I put uh, links so you can follow both George and Olivia on Twitter and a link specifically to the next session, which is run by Martin, Martina, who's here today, and Sophie. Um, and uh, yeah, it would be fantastic to see you at that. Uh, I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to hang around if anyone wants some informal chats uh, with me or with any of the speakers uh, just now. But otherwise, enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are and do come back to our next session or book on to one of the other sessions that we've got coming up. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>